Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 11, with Nanya van den Broek. My name is Donny, host of the Free Dive Cafe. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and fears and personal philosophies of the merry band of breath holders known as free divers. The Free Dive Cafe can be found at freedivecafe.com. All the episodes and show notes can be found there. Check out the Facebook page too and like it and of course share it with your friends. So a little bit of news about the website. Within the next week sometime I'm going to be adding a resources page there. This will be a page that lists YouTube channels, websites, instructors and their schools and that kind of thing. Anything with good information about freediving. If you have any suggestions for what you would like to see there, please get in touch through the contact page and I'll be sure to consider it. Without further ado, on to today's guest. Nanya van den Broek has been freediving since 2001. She currently has 40 Dutch records and one world record in variable weight, diving to 130 meters. In daily life, she is a freedive instructor, business trainer and coach. She uses the water and freediving as a tool to make people aware of their limiting beliefs and teaches them how to transform their thoughts to support their life goals. She is also working together with the Plastic Soup Foundation to make people aware of how to reduce their plastic footprint. In this episode, we talk at length about NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming, as well as the growing tragedy of plastic-filled oceans and what is being done to raise awareness of the topic, as well as how Nanya trained to break that world record. Nanya's show notes can be found on her page on the website. If you would like to comment on the episode, you can do it there. Looking forward to hearing from you guys, as always. Okay, let's dive. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say um, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, taking the time to talk to me and all our listeners. Yeah, thank you, Danny. So, you're from the Netherlands. Um, what do you, uh, I mean, how did you get into freediving in the first place? It's not, a, it's not a huge thing in the Netherlands. So, where did you first encounter freediving? Um, did you do a course? Where did you, um, did you have an instructor? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question because Netherlands is like the the lowest country in uh, on earth and uh, and and the shallowest. So I I um, had an introduction into the swimming pool. So I was a member of a, a scuba diving club and uh, actually not not to say anything negative about scuba diving, but I was a little bored. Um, and one of the the people there that was um, a, a Dutch team member of the freediving team at that time that uh, I'm talking about two thousand and one, um, and he he was uh, alone, so he was looking for a buddy. And every time when there was a training, uh, he saw me on the on the bottom of the pool. So he thought, hey, that's a that's quite a good buddy to to start with. So he <laughs> asked me, did you want to learn a freedive? And I said, I really don't know what you're talking about <laughs> because at that time nobody knew about freediving. Uh, so, um, so I said yes because I always like challenges. So he started me training, and he was an instructor at that time. So uh, I got some proper lessons. So and, was, um, was he? Yeah, like it was an, really fun. Was he like a an, an instructor with Ida or CMAS or something like that? Yeah, I, I think he is an IDA instructor. At that time, there were in the Netherlands a, a, a quite fanatic group of freedivers that started their own Dutch system as well. So he was an instructor for that system as well. So um, yeah, but it was it was a long time ago. So I, I made a lot of changes in the, mean, <laughs> in the um, meantime. When was that? 
um, when 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 did this when did you first encounter free diving? I think it was about September two thousand one, and yeah, we started training like uh, every week and started with static and dynamic because that's the easiest way in the Netherlands. And then after like five weeks, there was the um, uh, Rijnbrand Cup in, uh, in in Germany. And, um, well, he asked me, do you want to attend the competition? And I said, yeah, well, why not? So we, we got with the group in a little bus and I went down there. And I broke all the Dutch records at that time. So oh. that says something about the records. When your first also, competition. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I was second um, in, in the competition of females. So I thought, oh, this is really a nice sport. So I'm, I'm good at it. <laughs> nice. So was that just a, a pool competition? Yeah. And yeah. a cool competition. So when did you get your first exposure to uh, depth? Uh, yeah, well, before winter time, he asked me, do you, do you want to try and do the uh, constant weight as well? And I said, yeah, that, that really sounds like fun. So we went to a really dark and cold Dutch lake, <laughs> but, but, but I had fun anyways. So I did, uh, yeah, after one session, about 25 meters and... Actually, I was a little blue then when I came up, but that's because it's mentally it's harder to do 25 in in a Dutch lake than uh, than in the sea. I but can imagine, uh, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but I I really liked the the challenge because um, before I I always was a, a competitive swimmer and I did uh, uh, like uh, um, water polo and uh, surfing, windsurfing. So I always had sports in in water. So, um, yeah, it, it had the, the best combination of water relaxation and, and some, some competitive element in, inside. So, yeah. Okay, so you, um, you started playing around in the water when you were quite young? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let, let's dial it back a little bit. Um, you're from the Netherlands. Whereabouts in the Netherlands are you from? I, I live like uh, 15 minutes from uh, Schiphol, the international airport, so <clears throat> like 20 minutes from Amsterdam. Okay. And yeah, I mean, I lived there for a long time myself and um, the Dutch... Okay, it's a Hillegom, that's uh, uh, where all the, the flower tubes are. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 I know it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I lived in Amsterdam center myself. Um, I know the, the Dutch managed, they have a, a great ability to find their way into the water um, at all costs, you know, despite the fact that the country is not really the, the most uh, water sporty place in the world. They really love to be in the water. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay. It's a really big uh, sailing, uh, sailing country as well. Were mm -hmm. you into sailing and things like that as well? Um, no, I, I actually, I, I get a really fast uh, seasick. <laughs> oh really <laughs> so, yeah that's really a handicap for a free diver but uh yeah well i am so um the the wavy part was not was not my uh my part uh so only on the windsurfing but uh, I, pr I prefer lakes above uh above the sea because the north sea has like a um a wave tide that's uh, yeah that's awful <laughs> for my stomach <laughs> Yeah, I remember being at the beach there a couple of times and it's just like, I mean, it's even the same where I'm from in Scotland, just like kind of a, a brown um, and a black muddy sand that just stretches off infinitely, you know, really shallow and not the most appealing place to jump around in the water. No, exactly, because uh, I, I think the sea in every country I visited was more attractive than, yeah. than my own. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, you know, it's quite artificial as well you know it's such huge stretches of the dutch coastline are actually just like long straight lines that have kind of been uh, you know formed by man and their attempts to keep the water from inundating the country right yeah it's not only it's the whole of netherlands we uh, we we invented our our uh, country by ourselves yeah putting yeah. dikes and windmills and uh so everything is organized in this uh, <laughs> in this country <clears throat> yeah you're right yeah I think the next step should be to improve the visibility and the depth. If they can do that, then I might go back. Yeah, yeah. Well, I live here, so I have to do it with the uh, uh, traveling and uh, yeah, and my and swimming pools. Yeah, yeah. So you you did your first um, depth training in the in the Dutch lakes. Are there are there many lakes in the Netherlands where you have quite good depth and you can practice quite nicely? 
No, not really. <laughs> Actually, there are um, yeah, there are some like the, most of them are really muddy. So the visibility is always bad. So actually, I, I don't dive below 30 meters because, uh, well, I don't like to have really bad visibility and, and darkness. I don't feel comfortable by it. So I, I, I train more more shallow if if I train there. And um, and otherwise, I, I prefer to go to Egypt or a, a nicer country with a nice sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where would be the first place that you traveled to outside of the Netherlands where you got to experience some more agreeable water conditions? Uh, yeah, well, I like a, a couple of years before, I always went to uh, the hub, like uh, one, one time per year or, or maybe two, two times per year. And um, But I always organized for my students, um, uh, like the, the traveling, and then did a course as an instructor, then did some training, then a, a competition. So it was not like uh, I went there for a couple of months to train because, uh, well, I have children as well, so I don't get the, um, yeah. I, well, I, I, can, I, I would get it, but I choose not, not to go uh, for a long time in, right. uh, in yeah. another country to train. Yeah. Uh, how old are your kids? Uh, 10 and 13 years right. old. So are they fri- free diving already as well? Yeah, well, they, they're they really like water rats, but they're not, I, I, I think they don't like the depth as uh, as I do. So, so they think uh, it's it's a little bit scary what I'm yeah. doing, and that's, that's uh, so it's not really appealing to them. Yeah. So you started um, free diving in 2001. And yep. um, was it, so was it that first year that you attended the competition and you broke the records? Yeah. 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 It was just in like, like within two months or something. Oh, right. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was speaking to uh, Dan Verhoeven and uh, he also broke, you know, a few Dutch records, but we were kind of laughing about it because at the time it was like 35 meters or something like that. So yeah, uh, that's the same time. <laughs> yeah. I've spoken to many, many, many of my guests who have the same situation where the records were just kind of like ripe for the picking because the sport mm-hmm. was so small, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah. And then it was 2014, correct me if I'm wrong, that you, um, you became the first Dutch national to, um, break 100 meters. Um, yeah. So that was uh, that's 13 years, I guess. Of you know, it sounds like you really have been free diving and having a long, slow, gradual progression up to that point. Yeah. Well, I'm. I I always like like every discipline. So um, so mm. in in constant weight, I did I did well. So in 2005, I attended. Uh, the, the world championship in um, in Nice in uh, um, and I was eight eighth there so that was that was okay although in Switzerland in the pool competition I really I, I don't know what was there but that was my uh, worst competition ever <laughs> so I made uh, quite some mistakes so w- when I went to to Nice I only had the constant weight and uh, I was thinking yeah I'm I'm gonna go to to do it uh, in a good way and the first day of training it was okay the second day of training i really had a severe cold oh, <laughs> so no. there was so much slime in my head on every <laughs> place you don't want to have it so i i remember i was i was in the in the sea and uh first my monofin broke so i couldn't i couldn't dive so then tanya streeter she she uh, borrowed me one of her fins, so I was really happy, so I could train. And then I wanted to dive, and then there was the slime in my head, so I couldn't go beyond like twenty centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went off in the boat, and my uh, like w- one of the the athletes that were in my room, she said, "I'm really sorry, it's not personal, but I'm going to move to another room because of all the bacteria." Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, you're so just like a walking, uh, a walking sickness yeah. uh, delivery I was system. A bum, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was only with my head in a really uh, like a, a tile of uh, hot water and just steaming all. 
everything away. So I just had one one training in depth uh, before the before the competition. But then um, there was a a French guy of the like the the safety team, and I asked him to put my rope at fifty meters, what then was my personal best. But he did it like in a French way. <laughs> what is so the French I was way? swimming. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> no worries. So I was swimming down and then, well, you get the feeling something's not right at this moment. So I I felt that I was deeper than, than 50 meters and I was looking down and I saw that the bottom weight was even deeper at that time. So I decided to turn around and I came up and that was the, that was the, like the only time that I was thinking, I don't know if I'm going to be fresh when I'm when I'm up so uh thank god I saw the, the the safety diver and I think that at that moment the adrenaline really helped to do to get the diving reflex even stronger so it was an amazing feeling at that moment is it was like like do you did you see the the movie the matrix yeah yeah so then you have um uh, and uh, how is he called Nino or Nano I don't know the yeah, the, Neo, the one in, Neo, yeah. Neo, yeah, Keanu Neo. Reeves, yeah. Yeah, Keanu Reeves. He, he was, he, at one fragment, you, you see him, he, he's turning into the zero and ones, like he's the computer yeah. element. And I felt really like that at the moment. Everything was tin, tintling and it was really like, well, I don't know, I never did drugs, but I can imagine that it was, it was like that. And I came up uh, in a really good good way. So, but then... I looked at my watch and I did 59 meters at the time. So I was nine meters deeper. So I looked at the French guy and I said, well, I can't say that. <laughs> I'm going to kick your ass, something along those lines. <laughs> yeah, something like that. What the, what the fuck did you do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he, he, he checked the, the line and it was 70 meters. So uh, he really messed up. Yeah. But, um, well, because I didn't have training and I really felt confident of, because of the dive. So I, I did 58 meters in the, in the competition. But now that's not a really big number. But in, <clears throat> in that time, it made me eight of the, of the championship. Mm -hmm. So I was, for a Dutch diver, I'm really proud on that, uh, <laughs> that dive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you then um, continued to just gradually over the years improve your depth? Yeah, because uh, I, I never uh, took the time to seriously go, go for, the, for the depth. Uh, so I, every time I had to do it in a, a couple of weeks. Uh, so I made quite a big progression every time I trained. So uh, like the first time I went from th 35 to 50 meters and the the second uh, time I went from 50 to uh, almost uh, 60 meters and the fourth time to 70 meters. So, um, but, but it, because I went just one or two times per year, yeah, then it's gradually, <laughs> but in the, in the, in the times it was really uh, fast. Uh -huh. And did you ever, I mean, because you were making these kind of big jumps without long periods of training in depth, did you ever experience any kind of lung squeeze or barrel trauma, lung barrel trauma, or anything like that? No, well, actually, at the at the dive I was talking about because of the stress, I, I had a really, um, I had a sinus squeeze, but that was because of the snot as well. Right, yeah. But yeah. I, I cannot remember if there was a small lung barrel trauma. Um, so I think. The first time was actually when I was training for the world record for the world record dive in the friable weight. So then I squeezed uh, a really small squeeze. I'm I'm not really uh, squeezy. <laughs> Is that a word? <laughs> yeah. But then um, I had um, I had once that my uh, safety lanyard uh, hooked onto the brake of the sled. So I at that time I wanted to go up from the from depth it was uh, 115 meters and then I felt, felt a, a pull on my arm and that was because of the lanyard was in the in the descent the the fastness of the descent it was on the on the brake so um 
but I'm always really happy to have a backup s system. So I, I went down to the sled and just um, filled the balloon. So we always uh, train with a with a balloon. So I went up in no limits instead of friable, and then uh, yeah, it was okay. But because I had to make a really big turn in in the depth because of the the pull on my arm. I squeezed a, a small, yeah. small squeeze. But it sounds like you were quite lucky. I mean, if it was 150 meters and it was such a stressful situation that you had to do something like that, it's, uh, yeah, it's that's pretty serious. Yeah, well, I, I I train a lot on on always keeping my my stress level down as pos uh, yeah as much as possible. So that yeah that helps. <laughs> Just to kind of like before we get into your, uh, your 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 deeper dives and your um, your world records, do you remember anything uh, about free diving that was particularly difficult for you in the beginning? For example, equalization or um, anxiety um, or something like this. That some kind of challenge that you had in the beginning that you overcame. Uh, yeah, well, while I started with uh, with static, my my times in the in the beginning were like. Uh, for weeks it was about 115 so th that was it's amazingly if I if I do introduction uh, I, I don't have many people that just stay above one minute <laughs> they do more <laughs> yeah. so that was that wasn't that I thought oh yeah oh, oh yeah the, well the, I'm really good at this no uh, so I, I just had to um, to learn to know my body um, but yeah, well, I am really lucky person because I, I never think in barriers. So I was, I, I always let think in challenges. So if, if I can n not really do something, I'm going to learn it. And that's, uh, for me, that's, that's the fun of the sport. So I, I never, I, I, even in all that time, I didn't do every uh, discipline uh, still because uh, there's always a discipline that I want to focus on and then some some other discipline yeah I, I cannot do so no I'm, I'm really lucky and I don't squeeze but the I think the biggest challenge for me is is that I'm Dutch <laughs> well not not really the Dutch part but the not see uh, not see part so I have to do a lot of work mentally and that's that's really that's really hard work yeah. You don't have location on your side. I don't have location, so I always train in swimming pools. And for most of the free divers I know in the world, that's that's really their nightmare. But if you, yeah, well, if that's your circumstances, you have to do it with the circumstances you have. So so because I'm really limited in the time in in the ocean, I have to find different ways to to progress to to get to my aims to to, to do my goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Just um, curious, um, if you were starting with these static times of one fifteen, did you did you already experience like uh, contractions during that time? Yeah, well, I, I'm always talking with my students. What's a contraction? Eh? So everyone knows the contraction is in in the in the diaphragm. But if I ask a, a, a person to to tell me where their diaphragm is, they they usually they don't really know <laughs> where it is. So the, I think at 115, it's not, not like the CO2, uh, but it's more like the thoughts you have of the feelings you have in your body. So for example, like when someone is holding their breath for, for like the first time, a lot of them, they close the glottis, so the, the throat. But if, if you don't, train the glottis a long time it, it'll hurt it's like it's like the same when you like make a fist of your hand and you really squeeze 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 after a minute it, it's it's gonna shiver and uh, you you want to open it and that's the same with uh with your throat so if you hold your breath like one and a half minutes uh, a lot of people say yeah well i i really need air because uh, i i can feel it i'm i'm choking no, that's not the choking. That's just the glut. It's just the muscle that you feel. So because you're you're not really aware of what is happening in your body, you have an opinion of the feeling, and that is not. That's always like an, a negative thought, and that costs a lot of energy. So then you come up. 
but it's not necessary the the signal to come up so yeah in the beginning you're you're not aware that's really part of the fun of of being a free dive instructor so I, i'm an instructor trainer so i can do every every level but i still enjoy to do an introduction so much because of the amazement you can get from people that like the general idea what they can do and what they actually can do is so much more so that yeah you can you can see people get their yeah their like trust of themselves grow and um yeah like for for example if i if i work with a like for example i'm an ssi instructor with a level three uh, students, I, I always put some some um, mental part in it, and it's amazing what 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 happens because some sometimes people change their jobs or they're uh, they're like uh, uh, go into a retreat or what whatever. But it it like I always see like the the water is uh, is like a mirror that that makes everything. I don't know if you if you if you recognize it, but it makes it bigger. So if you have stress in your body, the water will tell you you have stress. And if, if you're really good in, you feel really good, the energy you use is much less. So the oxygen, I see energy and oxygen is like the same. So then you use a lot of uh, less oxygen. So then you, you're you really calm and can go deeper or whatever. It's like, it's like the equalization. I always know before I go to the depth who will um, uh, who is possible to equalize and who isn't. And that's not because I saw them uh, doing the equalization, but it's more like the, the comfort where they go uh, into the water or their self-esteem. Hey guys, are you enjoying the show? Sorry to interrupt again, but let me make a little call to action. The Free Dive Cafe is free and always will be, but it's a lot of work. Post-production on an episode takes many, many hours, which I usually try to squeeze into the lunch breaks of my real-life day job. Not to mention the hours spent in correspondence with the world's top freedivers, preparing for episodes and actually doing them, sometimes at ungodly hours due to the time differences. Everything is done on a shoestring budget with the most basic of equipment and I do everything myself. If you love the show, if you appreciate what I'm doing and want to see the show improve and want to hear more episodes each month, you can do that by joining the Patreon tribe. If you don't know what Patreon is, you can just go to freedivecafe.com and click the support the podcast button. That will take you to Patreon where you can choose to donate a few dollars to the show each month. Any amount is appreciated and there are some goals and rewards too. For example, once I reach 35 patrons, I will start releasing 3 episodes a month instead of the regular 2. We're now only 10 patrons away from making this happen. And once we hit 50 patrons, I'll be starting with the monthly Q&A episodes with a returning guest. So if you love the show and want 4 episodes each month, head over to patreon.com slash freedivecafe and join the tribe. Big love to all the patrons already supporting the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. What you say about the ocean being a mirror, it's been uh, said on this show a few times, you know, and it's um, one of the, one of the greatest aspects of free diving is how we can, it's kind of a, a fast, a fast track way to, to expose ourselves to parts of ourselves or aspects of ourselves that we didn't even know were there. It, you know, Definitely. E- even like to the extent that it could be kind of like a psychotherapy for somebody, I think, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I do that as well. I, I coach people uh, and the, the free diving helps me to, to really go, go fast in that because it makes something that's, that you unconsciously do. Uh, that comes up into your conscious while you're in water. So I have amazing with uh, experience with people with depression or burnout, and uh, yeah, well, you can change a lot about, about the way people think uh, while using the water. So, for example, the water has no boundaries. So the only boundaries you meet are the other one that people put them on themselves. Right. Right. So, 
so if you're really a good listener you can you can hear what what they tell themselves and sometimes that's not really like for, for for them the most helpful thought so if you make if you give them other possibilities and they get another experience yeah that's amazing what what people can do yeah i think you know especially as well because the water is like um um not to say that it's a dangerous environment but it's an environment where you need to be uh you need to be fully mindful at all times right because you know yeah it's not a, it's not a place where you can just kick back and watch tv so if anything no does, i always say it's, it's like a safe stress uh a stressful environment and just like you're holding your breath and holding your breath is is little little bit stressful and because i'm there it's a, it's a, it's a safe uh environment um but yeah because when you put people in the water they will do as as they always do in stressful situation so that gives a lot of helpful information yeah and if they can overcome the stress in the water i think as well that it really translates into the next time they have a stressful situation in the coffee shop or if they're you know walking down yeah. the street as well you know it's uh, it can also have that kind of benefit too right yeah, well, and and also in work or in relation, it's 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 uh, there. There are no boundaries in the in the possibilities that, yeah, that that the change will bring. I'd like to go a little bit deeper into the psychological aspect because I know that you work um, closely with people in that regard, and uh, and talk a little bit about uh, NLP and stuff like that too. Um, but before we get to that, um, let's talk a little bit about your record, the variable weight record. So you're still. Still the world record holder in uh, variable weight for females. Um, yep. That was a dive to 130 meters in uh, 2015. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us what's it? What is involved in the training and the preparation for a dive like that? Where did you train? Who was helping you? What kind of equipment do you use for a dive like that? Because I don't really understand variable weight at those depths like what kind of equipment you use could you talk us through it a little bit yeah yeah well um i think like uh, what you ask about the training it's really f from person to person so I, I only watch what what do i need to to get to a record like that so i started with visualizing the dive because i always like i'm I li i'm a little <clears throat> bit macho so i always said I can do a world record. So then my friend said, yeah, you always say that, so just do it now. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so then I was started thinking, okay, which which record is, is doable for me as a freediver uh, in, in my, my conditions? So then I thought, okay, then the variable record is for me is doable because I did the 100 meters in no limits in just a couple of hours of training. So I, I first started to do an uh, um, uh, equalization workshop with uh, Andrea Tukri. Uh, he was in Germany uh, then. And, uh, well, I, I, I trained a lot with all the exercises. So I uh, blew up balloons like uh, every free diver does <laughs> with my nose. And, well, uh, so, so you, you can really feel every, every muscle how how the your tongue work and the mouth work and the chin and uh, like every aspect of involved in equalization so you can um yeah well put every strain out how you want it and um after that workshop we decided to go for the one 100 meters to be the first dutch to do it because i have my own free diving school here and we thought that's also a good promotion <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, Killed we two went birds to, with um, one stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like a lot of birds in one stone. <laughs> the more, the better. <laughs> and then uh, we went to Andrea and um, in Sharm El Sheikh in uh, in Egypt, and we went training and we just did it. I managed in like six hours, including the the, the record dive. So I was thinking if I can do one hundred meters in just six hours of training, then the hundred and thirty is is doable. So I asked him, do you think I can do it? And he said, 
yeah, no, no, I think you're a really positive person. So I was thinking he meant like mental positive <laughs> <laughs> because I always think in that way. But then, uh, well, I noticed that he wasn't. He was work. He was meaning like my my buoyancy. Body and weight, I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my body weight. So I, love, I really like wine and cheese, and so I'm not <laughs> like the the best model of free diving. Um, so um, yeah, well, I I am buoyant, and I was thinking, yeah, well, I have a s- strong mind, and all the equipment and which, which NLP uses. Uh, for me, so I'm I'm really gonna go for it. Uh, so um, we we made a, a program in one year that has like about eight weeks of training in depth in three uh, periods of time. So that's really really uh, not a lot. Um, and for the rest, the training in the Netherlands. So I did a lot of cross training, like. Uh, jogging and holding my breath while while running and uh, to to get used to the co2 and uh, a lot of s- swimming pool and because i was thinking uh, let's make a test if i if i really can do the 130 meters so i went to the swimming pool and i i uh, looked at the numbers i did at the 100 meters so i thought well if if the sled goes to 100 in that time in 130 it has to be like one 115 so i hold my breath for 115 and then i went swimming for 130 meters because i think that's in the swimming pool it's harder than coming up because then you're more buoyant uh, in the in the sea so i think that's a, the test was a little bit harder than um yeah well then in the sea and that's only like physics and and body thinking not the mental part because i think the the mental part i just parked it somewhere and else and think first my ability as as a free diver let's test it so it was i did the most amazing 150 in dynamics after the 115 breath hold i did uh yeah in yeah well I, I cannot remember another time that it was that easy. So I thought, oh, this is really a good good mind that uh, that uh, my mind tells me that my body can do it. So then I started training and I trained. I always like to train with handicaps. So a lot of people have the, uh, they, they want to do like routines every time uh, a, a routine. But I think... If you train with a like a handicap and doesn't really matter what kind of handicap, um, then you you get more flexible and you can trust your body more that it will do what you want to do, to do it. So sometimes people were were talking to me or to Judith who is training me, my my girlfriend, and um, uh, she was doing the the counting countdown from two minutes to to zero, and uh, while she was babbling with a, an older woman or someone who was curious what I was doing uh, in the swimming pool. Um, and then I, I always wanted to at least uh, uh, 1 minute 15, either 1 minute 30, so we made it a little bit bigger, and 130 meters. So uh, And I did. Every time I did. So sometimes I, I forgot something and my weight belt was different or whatever. I did. I I wanted to do 115 with 130 meters in in dynamic. So that was one part of my training, and the other part of my training was more uh, well the equalization part because uh, I don't have the seat, so I have to do it in another way. So I have a like um, a face where you put your flowers normally in. <laughs> I put in a tube. And, and the tube was on an on a, a barometer. Uh, do you call it like that? The a pressure? barometer, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to measure the pressure, yeah. Yeah, to measure the pressure. And then there was a, a like a, uh, a round ball with a hole at the end, and I put it uh, onto my nose. And um, I put the the tube into the water as uh, as uh, far as I uh, as I had the same pressure. Uh, while equalizing in the sea, 
So you, you can measure it when at which pressure your ears will equalize. Uh, so and then I did all the exercise that uh, that uh, Andrea told me. So I, I charged and did the mouth fill uh, only on an exhale. So uh, I had some tr- stress because you do it on an exhale and tried to do like in 30 uh, seconds just to put your chin up. So then the air in your mouth compresses and then 30 seconds your your cheeks and then about 45 seconds your tongue until you don't have air in your mouth so that's that's hard <laughs> so, yeah yeah so you mean um yeah. so, sorry you i need to uh, just break this down a little bit all these different uh techniques so the 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 thing with the the vase and the and the ball and the tube um sounds like quite an interesting picture um uh, is that something that you learned from andrea yeah, yeah. He right. told me that that's a, a way to when you're on the dry land, you can train equalization in depth. Right. Okay. Um, I won't ask. I mean, I, I think Andrea is quite uh, protective of his methods, so I won't ask you to explain ex- uh, exactly how that works. <laughs> I won't. I won't ask you to draw me any pictures or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, Andrea has really got a good vision of on. Um, uh, he, he really wants to get free diving into a safe, safer level uh, through teaching people a correct way of mouthfeel. Yeah, I believe he's coming on the show next month or the month after, so ah, great, I'll, uh, I'll ask him. Um, yeah. so, and then you would practice like uh, exhale, exhaling and then doing mouthfeels. So when you say you put the chin, like put your head right back so that when you bring your chin back down, you're compressing the air? Mm, chin up. Chin, chin up, up. Uh, ex- inhale, uh, take the mouth fill with the chin up, and then you equalize while bringing the, the chin down again? Oh, no, no, I, 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 uh, I don't see the uh, much, um, in, in, if you do the mouth fill, and the, you mean after the charge that you put the, the chin up? Yeah, or you, so you, put the, no. you move the chin up to equalize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All so right. I hold my 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 head in the same uh, in the same uh, position because you can measure the the amount of mouthfeel, and it doesn't really make a lot of difference if you put the chin up and then down again, or just hold it in a straight line. So if you have your head in in a more straight line, uh, it's more in a hydrodynamic way. And um, if you uh, some people, if they really put their chin up, you you like open your chest anyway uh, as well and that's i think that's a dangerous part so i always i'm really sure that it's better to to hold your head uh, in the in the same correct uh, position okay so um you did all these uh, equalization practices the best you could do out of the water i guess and then what came after that yeah, well, in the, in the meantime, I visualized the dive every time. I like 24-7, <laughs> I was busy visualizing the dive because I want to believe that 130 meters wasn't, wasn't that deep. It was really good to do. So that's, that's the, I think that was the hardest part of the whole training, to believe that the 130 meters was really, really good, well, uh, quite an easy thing to do. And, um, yeah, well, it, I, I managed, so uh, it, it worked out. Hmm. And where did you do the uh, record attempt? Or where did you break uh, in the record? The, in, the, in Egypt as well, with uh, Andrea Center. So beyond the, the physical technique and the training in the pool and stuff like that, uh, you talked about um, NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. Could you maybe just for the listeners who don't understand what that is, explain what NLP is and how that can apply to free diving, how we can benefit from using it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, well, it's quite hard to really have like a definition of, uh, because it's it's more like uh, a lot of tools. um, And if you look at like people that do uh, psychotherapy or relation therapy or communication, Everything that really works, like uh, NLP, made it into a technique. So it's a combination of a lot of techniques, and it's always like a mental. So it's um, if it's between the ears, you can do something with NLP. <laughs> so uh, what the NLP people in the beginning did, they looked at really 
really good people on hypnotherapy and and relation therapy and everything and then they really looked at what the, do these people believe and they saw that there was there was a lot of things in common um, and they made of all the uh, behavior they saw they made techniques of it so you can learn it to someone else so that's called modeling so you you take a model look at what they can do really well and then like make it into fragments and make it a model so you can teach it someone else you understand that? yeah so you could like maybe like a let's say you were a tennis player you could look at a great tennis player and break down what it is that makes them great and then somehow transfer that model onto another person yeah but it's not only on like the techniques of the tennis player, but also on the mindset. Right. What is so what, what differentiates their mindset from the regular mindset of somebody who's not able to perform like that? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So what makes like for example a winner a winner? That's a different kind of of thinking. Tell us about your. You have a school in the Netherlands called uh, Inker Free Dive School, right? Mm hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about the school. Um, uh, how does it work in terms of uh, teaching courses when you don't have access to, to depth so much? And uh, what, what other kind of services do you offer there? Because you also offer some like NLP uh, coaching and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so I have, uh, on, on the one side is the, the, like the, the normal uh, freediving school. So I, I teach SSI courses, but I always get some NLP inside because that's uh, that's the way I work. Um, but, the, well, I, I use a swimming pool in uh, Germany that's like three-hour drive from here where I have 20 meters uh, of pool. So for the first two levels, I, I use that pool. And then for the level three, we go to a lake in Germany that has quite clear waters and a counter uh, ballast system. So, yeah, we, I, we have to travel. <laughs> so... The, so the first lesson I always say, so distance and, and time is different in freediving. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, that's still quite handy, actually. I mean, even three hours, um, if somebody is committed to the course and you have access to a 20 meter pool, that's not too bad. No, it's a, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm really, because before I did it in the lakes, uh, like in the Netherlands, but then like when, when the weather is like this now, because it's really rainy and gray, if I look outside, uh, then um, yeah, then there's a, uh, there's a problem because then in the winter time you have so many people that's piling up because uh, the mental part is getting worse because of like the the clouds there's less light and it's more dark and it's getting colder the water so it makes so much more problems for people to just get to the minimum uh, minimum standards. So the swimming pool in Germany was, for me, it's, it's really great. The lake that you go to in Germany that you said has good visibility and a counterbalance system, which lake is that? Uh, that's in uh, the Kreidesee in Hemmoor. Uh, I, I, Dan Verhoeven was already uh, telling about it. Yeah, that's it's right. A, yeah. 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 It's oh, a, okay. yeah, well, it's, it's really amazing because uh, it was like a, they, there was a um, company that put all this, uh, the rocks out of the ground there and uh, like the uh, everything is still there so every all the cars that get the the stones away are still on the road under the water so it's it's really nice to just free dive to uh, like uh, yeah well they put other parts like a sailing boat and a, a small airplane and everything on so yeah, if you have don't have corals, you have to <laughs> look for other nice things. <laughs> yeah. If you don't have coral, you have to drop a bunch of stuff in the water. So you yeah, <laughs> the exciting yeah, playground. I, yeah, well, it's, well, I love being in the water. So if I have a, a sun and some some sun rays in 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 the water, and you see all that, like the yeah, well, you you can see it in the sea as well. But if you if you see the the sun's playing. And the ra the rays go into the water. It's so lovely to see it. Well, I if if I'm in water, it's okay. <laughs> I think the next time I I travel back to the Netherlands, I'll I 
maybe see if it's possible to take a trip out there because I'd be really interested to see this place. Yeah, well, from the analysis, five-hour drive. So better take a plane to Hamburg. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> um, so just to sort of like... Uh, jump back very briefly to the NLP part there. Is there any, like, do you recommend any books or anything like that for people that would be interested in learning more about NLP or maybe websites or something like this? Because I know, you know, this people are always asking me questions about how they can improve the mental side of their training and stuff like that. So if we can give them some access to some more information, that would be great. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, well, there's a there's a lot of books in in NLP, uh, but uh, so the best the best way to do NLP is not reading about it, but just doing a course. Uh, so uh, like a practitioner, that's a, that's the first course. So I'm a trainer also in NLP, so that's like a lot of steps further. Uh, but doing the course, um, yeah, well, then you really can experience what makes the difference because I. I was at that time I was already an athlete and because I did the study for NLP and my normal job I couldn't train as much as I did before but because every exercise you have to fill in uh, a, like a problem so I, I fill in a lot of that that uh, exercises with something I I picked up in, in free diving for example like in static you have that voice in your head that says, uh, nah, 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 I don't like it anymore, I want to go up or whatever. Yeah, every every free dive knows that voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah, so then you, you take one of the exercises so then you can really experience what, what, what does it for you because then I could see, because I always lock my, my dice, that like 15%, um, like every like dynamic and static and every discipline was 15% better than before, although I trained like one third less. So that was amazing to me. And then um, it's it's all about the mindset. So you have like the, the dummy books, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's like also... NLP a, for dummies. A, yeah, the, the NLP book for dummies is really nice to start because it's really practical. So you can already like uh, try and... If you're at the supermarket or doing some groceries or whatever, or you're in your work and you have a really bad conversation with your boss, you can always try and do one of the exercises or you make a better connection between people as well. That's, that's also a part of NLP. So NLP is actually like a standardized system and you'll have like a practitioner yeah. level and then up to a trainer level, I guess. Yeah, master, right. and then uh, uh, yeah, to uh, okay. towards string. So, are the are these uh, like? Do you personally offer the NLP practitioner course as part of your services at the free diving school? Yeah, well, for for now, I'm I'm really too busy to to do a, a whole practitioner because it's like fifteen weekends in a year. Um, so, but yeah, but I have uh, quite some customers, so I, I hope to do it one time, but in another period of my life. <laughs> so for now, I just give short, sh short courses, uh, mostly with like uh, the the more experienced free divers, uh, so that they, yeah, well, they get to know themselves better and get more like content with themselves in 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 ways. And like when you're when you're working with another energy with yourself, and you're more in a positive energy, it always is getting back back into the water. So then your your techniques will improve. Like the feeling with the techniques will improve. Yeah, and I I like for example the book the uh, the structure of magic. It's really an old NLP book, but it's about uh, the one of the masters, uh, Milton er Erickson. He is, um, he's an hypnotherapist, and they were, were looking at the way he was talking to people. So it's all, all, um, it's all about hypnotic language, but you can use... I, 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 I experimented a lot with the self-hypnosis, and it really works out in a, in a re really nice way. So you can take some of the exercises, and it's a quite difficult book to read because I always fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Something for bedtime. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was reading and then 
I, I, I was sitting there with closed eyes and then I thought, oh, come on, come back. And then I had to reread the same page. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really calming you down. So that's a, that's a one thing. And um, But for example, in Excel, um, uh, Excel dives, I, I really get a lot of uh, extra time just by repeating uh, language patterns to myself. So I, I can tell you one example. This is quite easy. If you just t- tell you yourself three facts, and and the facts has has to be based on what's happening to you at that moment. So for example, um, fact one, um, I'm talking to Donny now. Fact two, I'm sitting on a chair. Uh, fact three, I'm listening to my voice as well. And then you get a suggestion to yourself so and it really makes me calm yeah then you start start again with a, a couple of facts and then a suggestion because your 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 head like your brain is already in an uh, yes mode so yes i'm talking to donny yes i'm in a chair yes i'm uh, i'm i'm listening to my own voice yes i'm getting uh, like a calmer yeah, so it really works into your your system. So if you repeat that kind of things to yourself, it's really really nice. Uh, yeah, to to calm yourself. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of like you're you're trying to um, you're being very suggestive, and you're trying to kind of uh, suggest to your brain to respond in a certain way. Yeah, and even if you know the techniques, it still works. Yeah, it's something I, I'm really interested in this. I looked into it many years ago before I became a free diver and, um, you know, just forgot about it. And now it seems like the time is, uh, has come to look more deeply into the techniques associated with this. Yeah, I don't really believe in coincidence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you say that, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, I'll for the folks who are listening, I'll put that NLP for Dummies book in the show notes. And, uh, yeah. The Structure of Magic was the other book that you mentioned too? Yeah. And that was by Ericsson, some Ericsson? Yeah, well, they, they modeled Ericsson. I will, I will look at the, the writer. It's from Richard Bendler. Richard Bendler, okay. Yeah, he's one of the founders of NLP, and he wrote the book. So he modeled Milton Ericsson. What do you think are, what, what for you are the best, like, supplementary training methods that you have done for free diving you know you, you said before that you did things like jogging and um well the the best for me is the nlp part so i'm really conscious of my of of, of what i'm telling to myself what i believe so there's like uh there are facts and there are convictions and there's a difference a, a lot of people think that their beliefs are true but the, they're they're not necessarily true. True. So I'm really aware of what I believe. So if I believe something that that helps me, it's it's okay. It it it's helpful. So I'm I'm building up my trust. So for example, I I believe I have a strong head, so I can do a lot with just my mindset. So because that's a belief that helps me, it's it's okay. But for example. Uh, like a beginner, if it says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of water. Yeah, well, it is really nice to convince them of that's not true, what you're telling, because uh, someone who is really terrified of water c- cannot hold their breath for one or two minutes, for example. So, that, so then you change the mindset into another belief. Okay, that's not true. So what then, what do I believe? So okay, water is okay for me, as for example. So then, the immediately the time will raise. If you would listen to yourself, what what do you tell? And is that is that making sense for me? And you have to be in control of that thought. For example, if if I had the idea, I have to eat on a certain way before, for example, for a, a competition. And I'm in a country where I cannot get that food. I have a problem because I need that food to to do a, to to get to a good result. So that that's something outside of my control. So that would be a, a thought that's not helpful. 
so then you have to let it go yes so yeah i understand so for you the the best supplementary training that you can have free diving is it's is mental basically essentially it all yeah can be most effectively um improved through mental training absolutely <clears throat> yeah of course of course there's a lot of beneficial things like uh like your 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 health and your your food and but i think that's a really smaller part than the, the than the beliefs if you look at the top free divers you and you would model them you can see that they're like all confident in what they do so they have convictions that support their thought so um if you look at people who are like average or 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 even less in in free diving they have a really different kind of uh way of looking at free diving yeah it's like um i mean these people have uh programmed their brains to be effective at this sport and yeah. over a usually over a long period of time like if you look at anyone who's diving under 100 meters and then you see a lot of people who come along and um, maybe try to rush into progress and depth and um, some bad things might happen to them or maybe they even just get turned off the sport because they're not making the progress that they want. But it, the, 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 the mental aspect is not there from the beginning. So it's kind of like you're, you're going uphill all the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Like like when when someone is is really good in in progress from the beginning, but they only look at the results, um, then they were not going to be a really top freediver because I know that every top freediver has a different reason why they love freediving. It's not only the result. No, the result is the result of the way they think. There was a time that I I was. Um, uh, overworked, I had a, I, I had a burnout, um, and I looked at, at free diving differently. I was always focused on on results, like like a lot of people are. And then, um, well, I did about five and a half minutes in static, for example. And then I got the burnout, and my times dropped like two and a half, three minutes. It was and hard work, but still, if when I, I I came off my couch and went to the swimming pool and trained on just getting as relaxed as possible for that time. I, I found out that I had more energy when I, uh, when I went back home than when I would stay and sit down on the couch. So then I was really enjoying just lying, laying in the water and getting as, as good, good as possible in, in uh, uh, getting uh, my relaxation. And I think that that really helped me in, in going back uh, into the normal uh, working uh, routine. Yeah, in, and um, uh, because, of, because of that, before I always said, yeah, why is my time isn't that good? Oh, yeah, yeah, my work is really busy now and my relation, la, 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 and this and this and this is the reason why my time isn't good. So, so I, I, I convinced myself, that's okay. And after that, I, I changed the way I was looking at the, the times. So when I saw that my time was, uh, was getting less, I was thinking, ah, what, what's there in my, in my life? What I need to change? Yeah. So I, I took, I took the results of, of, for example, my static. And I was thinking if it's, if it's a, a, a worse result, I have to change something in my life instead of, like um, um, convict myself it's okay because in my life there was something worse and my time's getting better so for me the freedom is also always a check how am i doing if, it's like if a, I'm doing a gauge that you can uh, check your progress and other aspects of your life yeah but also my health so for example i had a really really big test i i call it divorce and um it it took a lot of energy of me and I was thinking, oh God, is it, is it now the, the second time? And then I went into water and went some, some training and I did like a, a five plus still. So I was thinking, okay, well, there is a lot of stress in my life, but the like my deeper myself, my inner self is still doing all right because otherwise I couldn't do a five plus. 
So for me, it's all, also a, a gauge of, to look at the way my, my mental health also is, uh, if it's okay. And I think a lot of really good free divers, they enjoy being in the water and going that deep. That's also like a search into your, to who, who you are. And I think that the travel in that search is so much more worth than the end result. Like for an example, breaking a, a, a world record or your own record. Now that's, that's just the outcoming of, of your, your travel. Am I making some sense to you? Or? No, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's about the journey, not the destination, right? Which is kind yeah, of what you're saying. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. So you said that, you know, the really top free divers in the world, they're doing this for the reason the free dive is, you know, for some other reason than, than the numbers. Um, what, what is it for you that makes you free dive? Why do you continue to do this? This is very strange niche sport that hardly anyone knows about. And even those who do know about it don't really understand it. So why do you, why do you do that? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's my fascination of people that, that, that still makes me, me drive because, well, um, the water, the mirroring of the water of how, how people are, are thinking is makes me so, it's so fascinating to, to get people to know, uh, how, how, how their brain is working and how that, how, how works that for their energy because, like like what I said before, the the oxygen and energy, I, I just get them as as one. Like if you're good in your energy, you use less oxygen. You use a lot of oxygen when you're when you're in trouble for yourself. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I, I I get a lot of people with the best. Well, uh, a lot of trust me and tell me me their stories, and I just uh, help them to think in another way and uh, that always makes a good uh, it makes a good re reflection on how how they are and how they will be they're they're always more positive when they go away than how they come in yeah so uh, yeah I, I like to help people so for me just free diving is a tool to help people so that's it for you it's about being uh, giving to people and helping people and educating people and and also because uh, a lot of a lot of people have a, a lower self-esteem than necessary and it's amazing what people can achieve if they have uh, the right mindset so like live live with fun and <laughs> and and see what it does to your energy it's amazing yeah i mean it's uh there are some serious chronic psychological issues in our society these days, yeah. many, many people who are perfectly capable of doing incredible things, but they're putting themselves down and, um, you know, just can't, can't put one foot in front of the other to start the journey. Yeah. Free diving is like, kind of like what I was saying before. It's like you, you get thrown in the deep end, so to speak, excuse the pun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it comes up pretty quickly what you can achieve and what you can't achieve, right? Yeah, and, and, and just have fun in the in the way. It's it's really it's it's a basic. If you like for example, if you if, if you're a beginner free diving and you're gonna do and well you download one of the apps with a CO two or a or an O2 table and you're holding your breath and you're thinking, What am I doing? So just don't. That's not what <laughs> Yeah, just that's not that's not that won't work then. So if you have fun while doing it, it's okay. But if you don't have fun doing it, just don't do it. It's not necessary to be a really good free dive to do to, in your eyes stupid tables. No, just have have do other things. And some some of my my students also they are always doing. They're so serious in their training. So I always say, yeah, now training is about having fun in water and challenge yourself of course but but the fun factor is is so elementary and so many people forget it yeah that's amazing absolutely yeah i mean a lot of the people that send me messages are in that situation where they're just kind of obsessed about which co2 table they should do or what o2 table they should do and how they should do it and it's like if you're having if you're suffering through that experience that's you're going to program your your brain to associate 
holding your breath with suffering and negative feelings, yeah. right? So that's not the best. Of course, it's a good thing to do CO2 training, but you need to find a way to do it that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, there's also, like, there's a theory uh, about uh, that you have to count your contractions. So you, you can make tables and you hold your breath and wait until there's a certain amount of contractions. But then you program yourself on on l- lying down and wait for a contraction to come. And I don't know one person that likes a contraction. So why make the focus on something you don't like instead of like what you do like? So where where in your body do you really feel well and focus on that? And then if you program yourself on that way, on a positive may- way, in a fun way, in a relaxed way, then some people don't even experience contractions. So for me, like with the NLP uh, in in mind, that's not the way to to work with. And you're also you're also working on the result. And so it's really important that if you do your your schedules, you get a certain result. No, just have fun the whole way. You have fun the whole way, and then you get a a, a good result by yourself. So I I really like that. In the sports as well, if you want to be really good, you you have to have fun and you have to to have a learning, flexible mind and, and body and adjust and experiment so you get another result. Have fun, and that's how it that's how it happens, right? That's where the that's progress, how it that's where the real progress comes from, and that's how it can turn into something that you can do happily for the rest of your life and. It shouldn't just be some kind of like masochistic exercise to see how much you can no. suffer. Yeah. So, so when I trained for the world record, I always felt what, what, what do I really am, am in mood for this training? So I didn't make a schedule for weeks and months and like do it, do it, do it, do it because then I didn't have fun and I get overtrained before I do a, a, a world record. But I was thinking, what, what do I want to do now? And, and is still part of the uh, part of the goal to to get to the world record. But the world record for me was not the the end result. For me, the end result was to have more influence to to people to get to another m- mindset that's helpful for them. So, and I think that's part of the reason why I could do the world record in so uh, just a couple of weeks like seven to eight weeks of of training in depth because for me it was the journey onto the world record and of course i loved to do it but still i was working on the story to convince people to react in their own lives on changes you did this amazing dive of 130 meters is it something that you're still doing now or you or do you have another goal or are you still training to do um uh, to do deeper dives or has your focus shifted more to this educating and helping people area? Yeah, well, in the beginning of the, the record, I was really tired because uh, of, of the mental work I did. So then I thought, yeah, well, my goal was to do to have a world record sometime. So I did. So I, I finished until someone posted on the Ida jury I'm going to do a friable wage record in the world's record <laughs> attempt. <laughs> and then I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> hey, wait a, a minute. That's my record. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really making plans now. I have a, a really nice project with the um, uh, Plastic Soup Foundation to get more attention, to to get people aware of um, you know, how, how we behave towards our seas and how important the seas are and we make really big mess of it now well you know everything about that but uh, uh, so i'm working on a project and maybe it will involve a new uh, world record uh, yeah oh i hope so <laughs> yeah i hope so as well but uh, but we'll see i i um we're we're just planting the seeds so i have to see how the how the plant is growing but um yeah, well, I, I'm I, I'm also in the um, in the environmental part, really interested. How can you, if you're an influencer, like when you have a world record, people yeah get uh, they they look at you differently. 
So how can you use that influence to change the world in a, in a better way is a thing that really fascinates me. Yeah. So I, I chose to, to work with the Plastic Soup Foundation. It's a, it's a Dutch really a growing international organization. And um, they're making people aware of what, uh, what um, companies do. For example, like Unilever is also a really big uh, company and they have like beauty products and in in the and like L'Oreal, so that's uh, the French company, they use micro beads, some really micro uh, plastics in all their their uh, in, in the like the toothpaste and shampoo and uh, everything you put on your skin. So that's really awful if you think that your child is brushing their teeth with plastics inside yeah. and you always see the, and swallowing child. it as well yeah so they really made a like a, a a great campaign that they were telling the mom that there were micro beats in the in the the tooth the the well a child was brushing the tooth and it really made a a huge uh commotion so people were telling Unilever and, and L'Oreal, stop, stop putting all the microbeads in my shampoo and everything that can be, can be in, in our body. And, um, and it works. So they, they stopped with the, with the microbeads in, in those products. So this, this was the plastic soup organization that um, led a campaign that eventually led to Unilever and L'Oreal uh, discontinuing the use of these plastic beads in their products? Yeah, so I'm really proud to be an ambassador of of a of a company that that makes movements like that. Yeah. So is this um <clears throat> is this the organization of Boyan Slat? No, it's not. Boyan Slat is more working with um. He's from the ocean cleanup, and he he's more about the thrash that's on the surface in the seas. But the Plastic Soup Foundation said yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really good thing, of course, that he's he's um, he's doing that part of the the, the cleanup. But it's just one percent, one percent of all the plastics in the sea, because unfortunately, most of the the plastics in the sea are the micro parts of the plastics. So already, the the plastic sack or the plastic bottle that is. Yeah, between winds and rocks and everything and, and get small plastics into the water. And actually, we're, we're eating plastic right now because uh, uh, like in the plankton and every, well, a lot of fish eat on plankton, they found microbeads inside. Yeah, well, I mean, it's even, uh, it's even worse than that. I was just reading that um, a couple of days ago that... Uh, They've now discovered that the plastic is actually plastic fibers have actually been found in the drinking water. Uh, billions of people potentially are already drinking water that is contaminated by plastic particles. They did yeah. a lot of uh, they took a lot of samples of the water from the taps, and eighty three percent of the samples were found to be polluted with the plastic fibers. So, you know, we're at the point where we're drinking plastic now. So it's yeah, really time we are. that people. Uh, governments in particular um, take serious steps towards you know, reversing this problem because it's not a problem that you can just stop dead, but it's going to have to be turned around slowly. So plastic soup, where can, where can we find plastic soup online? Is that like, a, do they have a Facebook page and stuff like that? Yeah, they have. They have uh, the Plastic Soup Foundation. I, I think, I, I don't know if it's .nl, but I think it's it .com. Um, and um, they have a Facebook uh, page and uh, soon they're going to make a really nice uh, application you can download and they're still in the testing uh, uh, part but that would be great because then they challenge people to do environmental uh, challenges and then you get like uh, uh, steps into a better environment and um I'm I'm working as one of the the heroes. I you can download me in the app and see my world record and uh, also of Oliver Helms, a really famous uh, world DJ in, in dance. 
he's uh, in the DJ Mac on eighth uh, place. So he's uh, in, but more in people that are in their twenties. Like I am forty one, so I didn't know him. I'm well but past that stage now too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, and uh, and Jack Johnson, the the singer. So this is really going to be an international uh, launch on the Volvo Ocean Race. And so please download the app and, uh, and and do the challenges. So, for example, one of the challenges is just uh, choose to don't use straws in your in your uh, plastic straws in your drinks in restaurants or bars or whatever you attend, because then it already saves a, a lot of plastic into the uh, in, into into the ocean. So all that kind of challenges. Don't use plastic bags when you go and do have uh, go to the supermarket or whatever. But just take your own uh, bag and all that small kind of ideas and also the facts that uh, that you realize that you really can make an impact in a positive way on uh, on your environment. I often kind of bring up this like doom and gloom um, aspect of the plastic situation in the oceans on this show, but it's good that, you know, you bring this up and I'll definitely link to plastic soup in the show notes and, um, and try to encourage people to get involved with this application. It sounds like a lot of, a lot of fun as well. Yeah. It's important that people know that they can make a difference. And in, in the application, if you have something like, if you want to do a beach cl- clean up ev- anywhere in 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 the world you can uh, activate your campaign into the app as well so then a small amount of the money go to the plastic soup foundation so and they're really good in uh, their they don't care about money they're really they go for the uh, for the environment so they grow and have more influence than they already have on companies and uh, like for like for example what you just told about the water and the plastic in the water it's, it's actually uh, because of our clothes. So a lot of our clothes are with uh, uh, like uh, uh, plastic fibers. Yeah, so polyester when we put and a, things like this. Yeah, polyester, every, every poly that's, that's a plastic. So if you were doing your, your laundry and um, you don't, like for example, if you would use a little bit um, softener, I, I don't know <clears throat> it's an English word, but you put some softener so you're yeah, it's also softener uh, yeah yeah it, it's um you put it in 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 with your your laundry so then the the fibers of your clothes uh, don't loosen up as as fast as when you don't use softener in your in your washing machine so so there's all kinds of tips and advices you can find uh, about that and so now the plastic soup foundation is working with uh, with the companies that make the wash machines to get an extra, uh, quite a lot of extra filters so that the fibers will not pollute the the water and just rinse into the, uh, well, into our, into into our water that we uh, then drink. Yeah, so that's really great. People really can make a difference on an individual level and actually people really do need to make a difference on an individual level now because there's, still going to be a huge number of people, a huge percentage of the population of the earth, really, who uh, people who are not even educated enough to know about these things. So they will continue to continue doing these environmentally unfriendly things and disposing of their plastic, you know, in the ocean because they think it just disappears. So anything you can do, do it, you know. Yeah, it starts, it starts with knowledge. And I think free diving is... If you can see what we can do under the water, it's amazing what we can do. So if, if you want to do something for the environment and you really put set up your mind to, to it, you can do amazing things. So don't think, yeah, don't don't just hold up your shoulders and think, yeah, what, what can I do? No, you really can make a difference if you set up your mind to it. So... <clears throat> What's your what's your plan? Um, I mean, po- there's a possibility here that you might start training again for another record. And um, do you have a plan for the long term? Um, yeah, well, I'm not really a long term person. <laughs> yeah. Free- I-, I ask this question all the time. Free divers never are, so I think I should no, st- start remo- no. start removing that question from the interview. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, 
well, of course, I have some plans, but it's more like I'm already on, on that path I want to be. So for the environment, a positive way and influence people to 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 change their mindset into a, a positive thing. And, and Earth is one of the of the aims. So uh, the bigger influence I get and, and the world record is a, a tool in that. Uh, the the better I can influence people do to do a, a, a difference. So that's that's my plan. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you're in a good position to do that, and I I really hope you um, if you do decide to go forward with the the new record attempt, I wish you all the best. I'll be there cheering you on. And, Thank uh, you very much. Yeah, I think it's really great that you're taking this. Um, you're you're involving the environmental. Um, uh, protection of our environment and the oceans as part of your 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 life. Um, hopefully, you can influence people in a positive way to take up that kind of action themselves. Just want to ask you a couple a uh, couple of the fun questions that I always ask at the end of the uh, uh, podcast. Um, do you do you have some kind of a morning ritual? Not really, because uh, well. For example, I just did a weekend course, uh, freediving level one. So this morning I was really thinking, oh, I want to stay in bed. Uh, but then I, I had to get up because I had a like a, a water mirror session, so a coaching session into the water. <laughs> so I just stood up 12 minutes before the session <laughs> <laughs> started. So uh, I'm quite lazy. So I'm not the, the, the yoga type. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. more, I, I, the, I need my coffee uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's run to the next, uh, the next yeah. thing person. <laughs> yeah. I imagine having two kids, 10 and 13 as well, kind of um, means your, your mornings are not so flexible, right? Yeah, well, I'm the force. So I have, unfortunately, it's me. I'm just, I just have the um, the half of the time. So the time I I ha I don't have them. I fill up with all uh, like free diving, coaching, and companies and everything. And the other week, I try to be as as much as possible with my kids. So they're really, uh, really important, of course. And. Uh, so in the in the morning when when my kids are there, I just uh, go up early and um, and we have some breakfast together so we can talk how about the day uh, or, the, or we just hold the quiet because everything is a little bit grumpy but it's okay <laughs> when we're together it's okay. <laughs> At least you're together. At least you're together. Yeah, so. that's it. And do you have any other interests outside of free diving? Do you like have any other sports interests or something else like uh, hobbies? Yeah, I um, well, most of them are are in a way connected with the free diving. So I, I just love swimming, and um, we just bought a, a, a sub, so stand up paddleboard, and I really love to be in 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 water. Um, yeah, but and also I we have really nice dunes, uh, so I live quite close by to the sea. So uh, yeah, so so uh, I I walk a lot. Uh, just uh, try to do. A couple of times per uh, per week to go into the dunes and just uh, go enough for a walk with a uh, unit and we talk about plans and ideas or just just be together. Yeah. So Nanya, um, would you possibly be able to recommend a book or an author that you would love the listeners to read? Uh, yeah. Well, the, there's a documentary coming from the Jacques Mario, uh, Homo del Venus. And there's also a book that's really nice to, to look at it because uh, it's like the old school free diving in the time of uh, Le Grand Bleu at the big blue, the movie. And it's, I always think about that when I see that really nice picture book and, uh, and read about how, how they were thinking about free diving in that, uh, that time. So in the, in the coming of the, the new do documentary, it's, it's really nice to read the book of the Homo, Homo Delphinus from uh, Jacques Maillot. Oh, Homo Delphinus. That's quite, it's quite a bit of an older book, right? It's, um, I, I think it's yeah, a, it's hard to find, yeah. but uh, yeah, if you like challenges, you can take this yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, thank you for reminding me. I need to get a, get my hands on that book um, somehow. Um, so, Nanya, where can we find you um, on social media if people want to get in touch with you or attend your free diving school? Um, do you have a Facebook page, a website, and things like that? 
yes, uh, my my website is uh, www uh, dot anchor and that's uh, uh, yeah it's not like anchor in English uh, it's uh, it's Dutch phonetical so it's e on uh, n k e r dot n l um, and um, you can find me on Facebook uh, Nanya Vedebroek so um, and uh, anchor free dive education is uh, on Facebook as well I'm not really a, a social uh, social media person but I so now and then I try to say something useful <laughs> on that. just so everyone knows you're still alive yeah because yeah, the only it. way people will know you're alive these days is if you post on Facebook that's the only way yeah yeah it's true when it's on Facebook yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks again for taking the time uh, it's been really great chatting to you and let's keep in touch maybe we can do it again sometime um, I'll let you. I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your day, your Dutch afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Nanya. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>